concern mankind today, perhaps more urgently than ever before. This means that not only philosophy would be abandoned, but also the idea that mankind can and should autonomously take its future historical path into its own hands. To my mind, it is this message from Apple that makes his philosophy so important today and for the future. And that's why I'm delighted that this message is being fortified by this project here and by today's lectures on, on, on environmental ethics and human rights. Thank you very much for your attention. Enjoy the conference. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, I do not see Eduardo Mendieta, so I will turn it over to my colleague, Almos Nascimento. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Foreman. Uh, thank you, uh, colleagues. Uh, Dr. Eduardo Mendieta uh, was part of this project. We've been, we studied with Carl Otto Apple together. Unfortunately, he cannot be with us today, but he sent a message and I will read that message to you. Can you all hear me okay? Very good. I quote uh, Dr. Eduardo Mendieta. Dear colleagues, I regret not being able to join you at the launching of this project to commemorate and celebrate the work of my teacher and mentor, Carl Otto Appel. Some of you may know that I wrote the first book in English, on Apple, and that I edited at least two volumes of his essays in English. I had plans for a third, but as things go in life, it did not come to fruition, although the proposal is somewhere in my computer. I want to say that it's difficult to understand the transformation of German philosophy uh, after World War II without the pioneering work of Apple. He brought together the best of German philosophy in dialogue with early so-called analytic philosophy and American philosophy, in particular pragmatism. Apple's unique staging, Meet Gegen, encounters of key figures from these two traditions remain some of the most enlightened enlightening even to these days. Let me brief mention one of Apple's early essays now in its transformation of philosophy, Transformation der Philosophie, in which he brings into dialogue two figures that project long shadows into our time, Heidegger and Wittgenstein. In that essay, Apple announced that what Habermas would later called post-metaphysical thinking. Let us also quickly mention Apple's book on Charles Sanders Peirce, which in my opinion remains unsurpassed. I was instrumental in getting this beautiful and impactful book into a new paperback edition for which I translated the new preface. Finally, let me thank my friend and colleague, Amos Nascimento, who also worked with Apple. We began thinking about this project several years ago, but life and the pandemic got in the way. I am very honored and thankful for the enthusiastic response from all of you to be a part or to be part of this badly needed celebration for one of the greatest German philosophers yeah, in of the 20th century. Thank you. Unquote. These are the words of our colleague Eduardo Mendieta from Penn State University, who unfortunately could not be with us today. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nascimento. Um, after uh, this presentation, we move on to the first round of remembrances. Después, ahora, ahora pasamos a la primera ronda de recuerdos y le doy la palabra a la doctora Adela Cortina de Valencia, España.
No lo escuchamos, doctora. No lo escuchamos. El sonido, el micrófono. Good evening to everybody. Now it's okay. Sí, sí, thank you. I am very pleased to be here with so many friends here. Y quisiera empezar esta intervención recordando que conocí, es cuestión de recuerdos, conocí a Carlo Toapel primero a través de su obra, a través de ese trabajo filosóficamente revolucionario que es Transformación de Filosofía de 1973. En aquel tiempo se estaba gestando en España el tránsito desde una sociedad autoritaria a una democrática y nacía la ética cívica propia de una sociedad pluralista. ¿Qué se podía hacer desde la filosofía para apoyar ese proceso de democratización? Entre otras cosas, respaldar esa ética cívica con argumentos, dotarle de un marco reflexivo capaz de fundamentarla, o lo que es idéntico, de dar razón de ella, superando un doble escollo, el fundamentalismo y el relativismo. La propuesta de Apple era óptima, a mi juicio era la mejor de las existentes. Por eso entré en contacto con él, en principio por carta, y en 1981 personalmente, en un congreso que se celebraba en Stuttgart sobre Kant o de Hegel, über Formen der Begründung in der Philosophie. En uno de los descansos me atreví a acercarme al gran filósofo y descubrí que no solo era un filósofo excepcional, sino también un maestro cordial, siempre dispuesto al diálogo y la deliberación. Bebimos cerveza, como no, hablamos de la situación de la filosofía, de la ética del discurso, de la fundamentación filosófica última y también de la traducción de su libro al español. Escribo de una forma un poco rara, me dijo, ¿no es así? Y yo la verdad es que no se lo pude negar. Escribía de una forma complicadísima, pero clara. Y sobre todo su pensamiento era tan importante que debía ser conocido en todos los idiomas posibles. En el curso 86-87 pude disfrutar de una beca Humboldt en Frankfurt con un trabajo que Apple dirigió y ese tiempo fue esencial para mi bagaje filosófico. Participé en los seminarios de la facultad en los que se celebraban en Bad Homburg, en los cursos internacionales y también, por supuesto, en largas discusiones durante horas en el Café Laumar, en los bistres de Frankfurt y en la acogedora casa de Apple en Niedenhausen, junto a su esposa Judith y sus hijas. Entré en contacto con un grupo de profesores de distintos países que son hoy amigos y algunos de los cuales están hoy aquí. Compartí más tarde con todos cursos en Dubrovnik, en Noruega, en España y pude participar en el acto de investidura de Apple como doctor honoris causa por la Universidad Libre de Berlín. En estos espacios fui confirmando, confirmando que Apple encarnaba la idea de filósofo como pocos. Sentía curiosidad por todo y reflexionaba sobre ello filosóficamente. Recuerdo una visita al Museo del Prado y que hizo un alegato sobre la interpretación de la obra de arte desde el punto de vista de la alecilla, para asombros de cuantos nos rodeaban en la sala, que nos miraban con extrañeza. Pero sobre todo Apple argumentaba in earnest, argumentaba en serio, porque lo que le importaba era descubrir la verdad a través del diálogo y por eso era inusitadamente veraz. No había en el doblez ni engaño y era de una desbordante calidad humana. Para algunos de los que en los años 70 del siglo pasado empezamos a oficiar de filósofos, las propuestas de Apple fueron un soplo de aire fresco y conocerle personalmente un gran hallazgo, porque unía a su vigorosa aportación filosófica una cordial personalidad. Casado con Judith, una mujer extraordinaria, tenía tres hijas a las que adoraba, Disfrutaba compartiendo el tiempo con sus amigos y le gustaba el vino tinto, pero sobre todo podía pasar horas enteras discutiendo apasionadamente de filosofía, porque creía en su importancia para la vida de las personas y de los pueblos. En su 90 cumpleaños, Apple organizó una amistosa celebración con algunos amigos y discípulos y fue Habermas quien pronunció el primero de los discursos, alegando ser de entre todos los presentes el más antiguo de sus discípulos, y confirmando con sus palabras lo escrito en la dedicatoria de Conciencia, Moral y Acción Comunicativa. De entre los filósofos vivos, ninguno ha influido más en mi pensamiento que Carlos Toapel. Apple le escuchaba con atención, pero no pude contenerse y vino a decirle, sí, pero tú no aceptas la fundamentación filosófica última. 
En estos tiempos en que muchos de nosotros insistimos en la relevancia de la filosofía para el presente y el futuro humanos, pensadores que han creído vitalmente en ella, como Apple, han sido y son decisivos. Como en otro lugar he afirmado, contar con la persona, la filosofía y la amistad de Apple durante tantos años ha sido un gran regalo por el que no cabe sino dar las gracias. Muchas gracias, doctora Cortina. A ver, uh, la, el siguiente uh, participante es Matías Lutz Bachmann desde Frankfurt. Uh, Matías Lutz Bachmann from Frankfurt is our next speaker. Hello, I'm very pleased that Amos um, and others made it possible that we come together this way for us in the evening and for you in the morning um, in order to celebrate the century uh, birthday of Alota Apple 100 years. Um, I could write uh, something in the Frankfurt University a newspaper recently uh, last summer uh, when we celebrated the date within our uh, faculty. Um, I'm one of Apple's uh, students when he arrived at Frankfurt. Um, I learned um, the transformation idea of philosophy, especially of transcendental philosophy and the combination with uh, pragmatism, uh, Wittgenstein, uh, and the reflection upon what is critical reasoning uh, under conditions of post-metaphysical thinking. And it was always uh, an enormous impact. Apple had in my own thinking and development, especially with regard to Apple's permanent and never-ending discussions with Jürgen Habermas, was somehow this Google of the uh, excellent thinkers um, having in the intention to work out something in common, but with certain important differences, which never uh, stopped to be important uh, for uh, the concept of each uh, of these wonderful philosophical figures. And this made for more than 20 years, Frankfurt to be really an important place uh, on the uh, maps of philosophy worldwide. And um, I am happy uh, to say that uh, we in Frankfurt um, have not forgotten uh, Apple's enormous uh, impact on this discussion um, and we will continue uh, to remember Apple in not only celebrating birthdays, but in reading his texts and in the systematically discussing what he was uh, presenting to us. Uh, in the former uh, class of excellence led by uh, my friend, Anna Forst and others, um, Apple's philosophy was always and is still until today uh, an important uh, statement uh, in the whole discussion. And I can say um, I'm looking forward for something more differentiated uh, presentations and discussions in presence. Um, this is something Amos uh, suggested to all of us um, to realize sometimes next year. And I, I'm very hopeful that we are able uh, to realize that in common. The day today is important since we can see how far reaching Apple's influence is still and has been in the past. Um, it is uh, the international openness and especially uh, the discourse uh, with the School of Bristol, uh, from where many of our colleagues today and tonight come from, uh, which made Apple's 
Discourse Ethics and uh, the addition, the theory of responsibility as part of the discourse ethics, uh, something uh, to a milestone in the bridging the transatlantic discourse in philosophy, including elements of Middle and South American uh, philosophies of liberation into uh, which is a much more political uh, dimension of philosophy than we in Germany traditionally uh, are focused in. This is a learning process still um, present and uh, will be continued uh, by us and our students in the years to come. And this is a way how to commemorate uh, Apple in the right uh, way. He is a thinker we have to uh, explore, um, we have to uh, read again under conditions um, of political, social, economic, and cultural uh, conflicts in the world today. And we can learn so much from both Habermas and Apple, but Apple is the older one. Habermas learned a lot from Apple and insofar we can say Apple uh, is a guiding figure uh, for these discussions uh, to be realized by us and the next generation. Thank you, Amos, and all those who made this event tonight possible. And that is a promise to be in Frankfurt. Eva is with us tonight uh, and others to be in Frankfurt will continue uh, to work on Apple's work as uh, a member um, of our community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthias. Always a pleasure listening to you. Um, next person on my list is Dr. Alden Ofsti from Trondheim, Norway. I do not see you. You're on by oh, a different there. name. Uh, otherwise, uh, let me pass the microphone on to uh, our colleague, Jorge Zuniga from Mexico. Gracias, Timo, Michael. Hello, everybody. Hello, Allen. Habíamos invitado también al doctor Enrique Dussel. Eh, quien es un filósofo que sostuvo una eh, plática, un diálogo muy amplio de más de 10 años con eh, Carlos Toapel. Sin embargo, el doctor Enrique Dussel eh, se, se sentía un poco imposibilitado para ser parte de, de este homenaje merecido a, a Carlos Toapel. Sin embargo, eh, el doctor Enrique Dussel hace llegar unas eh, palabras para la familia de Carlos Toapel eh, en honor a su 100 aniversario eh, y son las siguientes eh, tengo los mejores recuerdos de Carlos Toapel después de un diálogo norte-sur que sostuvimos durante más de 10 años a Carlos Toapel hay que agradecerle el que los, la filosofía del norte se haya abierto a, a dialogar y platicar con la filosofía del sur. Le debo mucho a Carlos Toapel, con quien siempre se estuvo un, una plat, un diálogo de mucho respeto y de altura filosófica. A Carlos Toapel y a su familia, mis mejores deseos, recuerdos y un abrazo. Enrique Dúcil. Uh, Michael Foreman, if I may very briefly translate this to our friends who didn't hear, those are the. This is the message from Professor Enrique Dulso to the family of Professor Apple, uh, thanking for the the many years of dialogue and all that he's has learned uh, in in his conversations and friendship with Apple, and he sends a message. Uh, he cannot be with us today, so thank you, Professor. Zuniga, 
back to Professor Foreman. Mute myself. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, the next item on our agenda is a presentation by Professor Matthias Kettner from Witten, Germany. Uh, siguiente, la siguiente ponencia es por el Professor Matthias Kettner. Um, eh, se llama Ethics and Human Rights, la ética del discurso y los derechos humanos. Uh, Dr. Uh, Kettner uh, will speak for a little bit under 10 minutes, followed by 10 minutes for questions from the audience. Um, so please uh, take it away, Dr. Kettner. Thanks, Michael. It's a grand pleasure to see you all. <laughs> uh, um, es una comunidad de comunicación virtualmente real. Uh, um, it's been a long time that I've seen uh, some of you. Um, so actually, I'm a bit in a difficulty, in a difficult situation because um, the allotted 10 minutes will not at all suffice to do justice to the theme that I have been uh, <laughs> uh, given. But uh, I will, um, I will sort of dive into the middle of uh, a large field of questions, and uh, why would why would I do this on an occasion like this, which is celebration and not a scientific conference, right? Um, well, I would do it because um, the only point I really want to make is, I think there is a lot of work to do within the framework of discourse ethics and Arpalian discourse theory in general uh, concerning human rights culture and. Uh, this is the only point I want to make. So let's 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 um, get into a presentation. Um, am I allowed to share my? Um, um, uh, Carlos, can you allow me to um, press to to uh, share a presentation? Yes. Now you can. And please, Matthias, take take your time. Don't if, whatever is necessary to mm. convey your message. Please go ahead. Yeah, now I have to share my uh, my PowerPoints, but um, let's see. Oh yes, here we are. Okay. So. Oh. Just give me a sign. Can you can, can you full screen? Okay. You were just on. It's gone. My suggestion, Michael, let's go to the to four other people while uh, Matthias Kettner will certainly come back to us as a technical problem, our apologies. But we have some other folks who can meantime uh, present their homage to Carl Otto Apple. We have Jesus Conil, Mariana Papastefano, Papa Papa uh, Juan Nicolas and Hans uh, Shelskorn. So let's do that round while we wait for Matthias Kepner to get back to us. Thank you. Okay, listo. So, uh, Jesus, Dr. Jesus Conil, de Valencia, España. Uh, sorry for the technical problem. Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm back now, am I? <laughs> yes, Matthias, uh, yes, we're sorry to, to lose you. We're wondering, so, uh -oh. Yes. Okay. Back to you, Matthias, and then we'll go back to uh, some folks yeah. who tell us something. So, let's try again. So, uh, just some points to consider concerning discourse, ethics, human rights, and human dignity. Um, now, I think um, the when when you when, when you look at the substance uh, of, you, uh, of of human rights, the declared human rights. Um, you see that 
for you, uh, you, you can see that um, the globalization of human rights culture, I would say, is a massively important political project. Um, is this true? I would say yes, but of course, um, this is a point to be argued, not here, but uh, you, one can differ in opinion. Um, then also, the justifiable globalization of human rights culture is not only an important political project, it's also important to, um, to find uh, rationally robust justifications, at least um, for um, the notion of human dignity, because this is at the core of what we um, moderns understand by human rights. Now, um, when you see the document, I mean, well, when you see the declaration, you analyze it, you all know it consists of 30 um, norms uh, expressed in 30 articles of the declared human rights. And um, the first points to note uh, is that this is the expression of an ethos. Um, it, uh, even though um, these normative, I would say polynormative universals, each um, human right is a polynormative universal because it can be inscribed in positive um, legislature and it's also, it also has a moral claim um, and um, so it can be positive and uh, more than positive, call this the post-conventional nature of these universals. Um, each of these specifies an element of a texture that is open. That's the first important point. That is, um, if you, uh, with a lot of idealization, look at this present day substance of human rights, what one has to realize is that it's a that it's at the moment a result of political and moral discourse, a discourse that can go on and can um, change the normative texture of human rights as we have it now. So the first point is the texture of human rights is inconclusive and we need political and moral discourse to continue refining this texture. Uh, the second point is, um, these 30 human rights are a very heterogeneous lot. They um, address very different concerns that humans typically have. Um, so it's an uneven texture, I would say. And again, we need discourse um, to uh, again and again in applications and in political contexts um, of of the observance or the violation of human rights again and again to spell out the relative importance and the interconnectedness of this rich texture of human rights. Without proper discourse, uh, this cannot be done. And the third point I want to make about the texture of human rights is that um, we have, yes, we have uh, since 1948 the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but some more declarations um, from other cultural contexts have also come into being. So we're dealing here with a plurality of declarations of human rights. And um, here again, there's a lot of work to be done from a discourse ethical point of view. Uh, now, um, uh, in terms of an intercultural uh, view of discourse ethics. So interculturalizing discourse ethics is a huge task that bears directly on the viability of human rights culture. Um, now, no discourse ethics without a proper notion of discourse, I would say along Arpalian lines, we can conceive of argumentative discourse as the practice in which revision or re-evaluation of conflicting reasons is permanently possible, permanently possible, and must remain possible in order for us to engage in this very activity. Now, from this core intuition of what argumentative discourse as a practice amounts to, follow all the 
um, properties of argumentative discourse that you all know, like its, um, its, its continuity, its openness, um, the unbegrenzte virtuelle Kommunikationsgemeinschaft, it's all uh, in this core concept. Um, also, the re-evaluation of conflicting reasons proceeds by bringing to bear further reasons to bear on those reasons. Um, and it's all about determining the true value, not the truth value, the true value of contested reasons. Um, we can characterize argumentative discourse essentially in the following way. Argumentative discourse is a social practice open to all persons in their capacity as reasonable evaluators of reasons, which has as its aim, this practice has as its aim, the communicatively rational revision of conflicting reasons with apparently less conflicting reasons. And now here comes the discourse ethical importance or significance. Um, it is that this practice of discourse, in this practice, lie, uh, there is a dynamic and a self-corrective construction of impartiality, of solidarity, and of collective moral responsibility in the sense of taking seriously how our actions or the norms by which we regulate our actions affect ourselves and others for good or ill. Um, this said, um, let me uh, specify or let me identify uh, broadly another interesting uh, field of discourse uh, of for, for a discourse ethical theory of human rights. Um, within these 30 articles, uh, as I said, they're very uneven. One can distinguish a discourse ethically particularly relevant, relevant pattern in this normative texture. And this is the article one, which of course, as I already said, contains the normative matrix um, to which the explication of concrete um, human rights always refers back to, namely the notion of human dignity. And then it's article 19, everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. Um, and Article 28, which spells out the universal scope that is meant in this global project of human rights culture, everyone is entitled to a social and international order in which the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration can be fully realized. So why do I call out these, or why do I highlight these three articles within the 30 articles of declared human rights? I think article 1, 19 and 28 um, are necessary for a discursivization of the practice of human rights. Um, article one, of course, um, has to be um, has to be made or has to be given a convincing interpretation so that across cultural differences, um, there is a rich notion of human dignity, which everyone can um, at least um, uh, um, uh, accept um, rationally. And then Article 90, which is a global freedom of communication, is actually necessary for there to be a global community of communication. This is almost, this follows trivially. Um, but what is non-trivial is that uh, human rights as a living normative texture and as a global project of human rights culture, um, can only succeed and can only correct itself uh, and continue if there is a constant monitoring possible by everyone of uh, around the globe of the very practice of human rights culture. And this is only ensured by Article 19. So Article 19 constitutes a global sphere of communication with regard to human rights culture. And this is necessary, of course, for this human rights culture to be discursive. And Article 28, of course, um, this is the, this specifies, as I already said, the universal scope and um, ambition 
of this project of human rights culture. Okay, uh, since I've already used 14 minutes, um, I think I have to rush to an end. Um, okay, actually in, an, in, a, in, in thinking about the Kantian concept of human dignity, um, I found this concept wanting. Uh, so we cannot really appeal to Kant as having already given us a, an account of human dignity that is um, refined, that is realistic, that is relevant, and that is reasonable. But I think, and again, I'm, 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 I'm awfully sorry. I mean, I have a lot to say about this, but I, um, I, I cannot say it on this occasion. So this is just um, sort of um, hand-waving, but I think that along our Palean lines, we can really give a very um, um, a, a robust account of human dignity. Um, and this holds together the normative ties of human rights culture. So it's not just an exercise in academic theorizing, um, but it has a practical import um, because without proper justificatory resources, human rights culture will not go on flourishing. And without human rights culture flourishing, uh, we will all be, live in a world that is more Hobbesian and um, not really a good world and not a world to strive for, not a world that could comply with um, another very interesting principle that our Palians know, but non apalians have to be convinced of, namely the Ergänzungsprinzip, the principle E, um, to which I can again only on this occasion uh, hand wave. But um, I mean, you know what I'm talking about. So let me stop here. I have used my time and um, I'm now interested to hear comments. I see Rene von Schomburg's uh, virtual hand, so go right ahead. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Matthias. Uh, a short but difficult question. Uh, we, I think uh, you would agree that we cannot uh, interpret human rights in a too individualistic way. And um, as we all know, um, Abel had this uh, vision of, a, of an, a macro ethics of co-responsibility. And uh, one could argue that consistent with such an um, uh, macro ethics or metacultural ethics, uh, one would not have only rights as individuals, but also obligations as a community. And, uh, you know, there is already, let's say, in the concept of, um, of the uh, controfactual anticipation of an ideal uh, community of uh, discourse, uh, a future perspective. One cannot think of, uh, uh, you know, an, uh, an anticipation towards... Uh, such a community in a limited uh, period of time. So one could, could with this future dimension, and I think uh, Apple mentioned it once in one of his articles in passing, uh, just in one line, uh, in one sentence, I believe. But it seems to me that consistent with this idea that there would be an obligation for the, the, the community, the world community as such, for survival, so an obligation to survival, to strive for survival. But if you would postulate this um, obligation, then the challenge of a meta cultural ethics would even be more complicated and challenging because um, uh, populations would ob obviously disagree on how this uh, strategy to survival would look like. and. Um, Unfortunately, we live in a situation in our world where this becomes more and more urgent. So, well, make the question short, is there not a corresponding um, 
obligation enshrined in the um, in this part B ethics in terms of some kind of obligation for survival. Um, well, this raises a host of questions, and um, as as you well know, um, what you are asking for is a. Uh, whether there is something like um, a discourse ethical argument against collective suicide, right? Is it is it that? <laughs> um, um, okay, I, I would I would opt, I would um, prefer to um, change the the framing and um, just speak of the Anthropocene. And this is a concept that is very important nowadays, and I think it's a valid concept, uh, even even though there are some. Uh, it, it's not yet a very precise concept, but um, it it carries a sense of urgency um, with regard to um, collective survival and flourishing. And um, now, discourse ethics, as I have come to understand it. Um, I mean, my, my project for many years is, um, uh, is is realistic discourse ethics, and I think a realistic discourse ethics is always. Um, I mean, Apple. This this is really something that Apple always has advocated. Has to be has to address this world and the concerns of us living in this world, and not possible worlds. And um, if the Anthropocene is a is an ethic ethical concept, then it's not only descriptive, but it, it does carry the sense of urgency and obligation to do something. And I think discourse ethics has to take up this sense of urgency. And this, I mean, theoretically, it can be framed as the continuation, the sustain, sustenance and flourishing of the community of communication under very adverse conditions to for which for, for which we, for, for which there's a collective responsibility. So I would, actually, I would, uh, I, I think Eva, Eva Budeberg, um, well, uh, okay, we, we've been talking about this. Maybe for future work in the Arpalian framework, it is very important to, um, to let the part about Letztbegründung, rationally definitive grounding, um, put put it aside for a while because a lot of it has been really thought through, um, and turn more to the to notion to Arpelian notions of co-responsibility and collective co-responsibility in a situation which we call the Anthropocene. Then I think Arpo there can be a, there can also then be a nexus made between Arpo and Fiona's ideas about ethics, uh, macro ethics of responsibility. So, I think this is a this is a, a focus for um, going on with the Arpelian framework. Yeah. So um, that is this is all, Rene. I, I, I can uh, say to your um, uh, very complex question at the moment. Yeah. Thanks. I am not seeing other questions. Oh, since I know, oh, uh, since I, oh, almost. No, very very briefly, very briefly. Thank you, thank you, Matthias, for, for this presentation. I remember uh, reading a recent article uh, that you published precisely on the first uh, point about human dignity. And uh, Matthias Lutz Bachmann and I recently published a book on that subject as well. So I wonder, you know, you are very critical of the Kantian conception of human dignity. Could you tell us a little bit more? What's the problem with the Kantian conception of human dignity on, uh, on your account? And what's your discourse ethical interpretation of that concept? I know it's a complicated question as well. And I know that some other people like Andreas Niederberger and others are making similar points uh, in questioning the Kantian tradition of human dignity. So 
Yeah, I wonder if you could share with us. Let me just translate my question in Spanish very briefly. Uh, yo pregunto a Matías, a Matías Ketner sobre el concepto de dignidad humana que él ha en cierto sentido criticado. Y yo me pregunto uh, por qué esta crítica, de dónde viene esta crítica a la concepción kantiana de, de dignidad humana y cuál es la alternativa que él propone a partir de la ética del discurso. Gracias. Thank you. Okay. Um, no, Amos, um, as much as I would like to really address your question, uh, I think the situation now time-wise and pragmatically um, is not apt for um, um, doing justice to your question. So, uh, but let, let me at least give some, um, um, some hints. Um, I mean, the Kantian project of a rational morality is a revisionist project um, in that um, he wants to spell out with the categorical imperative, imperative um, uh, normative constraints that apply to the rational will of whatever being. Yeah, so it's the rational will that's at the core of Kantian ethics. It's an, an ethics of the autonomy of the rational will. And human dignity for Kant um, comes through the moral law and the moral law is a moral law that is binding on beings that have a rational will in whatever possible world and this is just too big uh, for this world i mean just to to allude to the to the difficulties um it's a it's a it's a project of revising um a notion of morality it's an it's an overly rationalistic notion, I would say, to cut a, a very complex point very short. Um, and this is um, extremely um, intriguing, but Kant thought <clears throat> that he was reconstructing our common morality, which he didn't, in fact, and this can be shown. And I think that a notion of human dignity that satisfies the four constraints that I have briefly um, uh, shown in my in one of my PowerPoints um, has to be secured within the framework of common morality and not of a revised rationalistic morality in order to be useful to uh, bolster up and support um, human rights culture. <laughs> and I can send you the article about <clears throat> Kantian uh, dignity semantics in which I criticize um, Kantian notion of human dignity uh, on that point. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that it's, um, that it's incoherent. Um, I, all I'm arguing in that paper is that in all its variants, you can show that it's not really useful, not relevant for supporting human rights culture. That's the point I want to make, yeah, so. <clears throat> And now, um, again, I mean, we don't have time, but um, there are a number of Arpalian lines that lead to, an to a fairly convincing explication of a notion of human dignity. One of these lines is the self-reflective line. Um, when you ask um, any, uh, any person, uh, or ask yourself, who should have human rights? <clears throat> Or who should, or who should be respected in a certain way? We call human dignity. Then you already have opened the discourse, and you're in a situation in which you can show that certain normative constraints must hold for everybody who is capable of ver of of the, of the very act of putting into question who should count. Yeah? and this being able to raise a question is something that you could generalize as communicative competence. So it would be the potential for co communicative competence. I say the potential, not the, not the actual um, um, state of communicative competence. The potential for, for communicative competence, which is typical of the species of humankind. This is one, uh, one point on which an Arpalian explication of human dignity could latch onto. There is another line of another Arpalian line, which I find um, even 
more promising and which I have explored in a number of papers. And very briefly, this line goes like this. Um, it's, it's, it's typical of, um, the species of our species of humankind that we develop, we, we develop a moral stance. That is, you find no human community in no epoch and in no culture without any kind of recognizable morality. Um, and so this is a, a, a cultural universal uh, quite as, as significant and quite as momentous as the cultural universal, for instance, of being able to learn a native language, right? So um, this typical uh, ability or capability of developing a moral stance, a morality of some kind or other, um, this is something that we do. So we are the origin of moral responsibility. We give status to us and to whatever our morality gives status to. Um, and human dignity can be explained along Arpalian lines as the special or the basic moral status of givers of moral status. It's unique to us that we give moral status, uh, for instance, to, I don't know, to the great apes or to other animals if we want to, uh, or to, yeah. So any kind of moral status has at, at its origin our ability to give moral status. And this is the very point in which we are special. And human dignity is just coding this uh, special place of us within the web of moral responsibilities. Namely, we, we are the origin of this web. <laughs> Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, we have one more question on the chat, which I am going to convey from Sprue. I, I don't know you, so I hope I did not mispronounce your name. And the question is this. You stated that there are now a plurality of human rights claims by other groups. Can you give an example of one of these other groups and what that means for the effort to our justification of a human rights discourse? In short, how do competing claims of human rights help us arrive at a strong grounding for human rights? Uh, voy a decir la, el, un, para resumir, um, ¿cómo, ¿cómo pueden diferentes uh, reclamos de derechos humanos ayudarnos a llegar a, un, a una base buena para derechos humanos? Take it away. It's a simple question, I'm sure. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> um, well, um, Johann Schäckshorn could say a lot on this. I mean, he's our specialist for uh, intercultural discourse. <laughs> and if this were a conference, I would now pass the microphone to you, Johann. Um, as we all know, there's, there's um, a, um, an Islamic declaration of human rights. Um, and I cannot go into the particulars. Again, this is not the, the, the scientific conference to do this, um, but um, this is a real challenge for um, the idea that human rights should have a texture that is uniform. Um, there's also, there, there are two or three other, um, the Cairo Declaration of, of Human Rights. Um, there isn't, so much work up to now, I mean, uh, in, 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 in the normative realm, to compare the um, different justifications that give rise to differences in normative content in all these declarations. There's, of course, a lot of sociological work. Um, um, but again, I think for discourse ethicists, um, this is still a task ahead to normatively compare and compare the justificatory resources um, of the three or four human rights declarations that all claim to be universal in a, in a, in a special way. I, I can't say more to this now. 
but of course it it it, it depends i mean uh, okay i think it follows almost trivially that if your notion of human dignity is tied to a no it is not a secular notion but is tied to a notion of a um spiritual um mm, omnipotent creator like in 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 all monotheisms then even though you can agree with a secular um, proponent of human dignity still in spelling out the implications of your different notions of human dignity you will end up with more or less different content in the texture of human rights Ok, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kettner. Muchas gracias por su ponencia y sus respuestas. Ahora en nuestro programa vamos, vamos a resumir con más recuerdos. We're now going to move on to more remembrances uh, with Jesús Conil, Mariana Papa, Papa Stefano, Juan Nicolás, Hans Schleckershan. Uh, we're now moving on with Jesus Conil from Valencia, España, Mariana Papa Stefano, uh, Juan Nicolás, and Hans Schreckhorn. Um, Dr. Conil, siga, por favor. Eh, ¿Se oye? ¿Se oye? Sí. Eh, bueno, eh, ante todo, muchísimas gracias a los organizadores y especialmente a Amos Nascimento por eh, organizar este acto de homenaje a Carlotto Apple. Eh, por mi parte, como hay tantos oradores y participantes, no quiero ocupar mucho tiempo y, y hemos de tener ocasión, como se ha visto, para seguir pensando juntos desde la seriedad de la argumentación de Apple, como se ha visto en la ponencia de Kettner. Y solo quería reafirmar que fue para nosotros, especialmente en España, como ha puesto de relieve a De la Cortina, fue una inmensa suerte conocer y disfrutar del magisterio de Apple en Frankfurt y en las visitas a España y en otros lugares, porque eh, nos ha dado la fuerza para tener un marco fundamental para seguir pensando con seriedad en este nuevo mundo que está bastante desorientado. Necesitamos en este tiempo reforzar un pensamiento profundo. Por lo tanto, estamos inmensamente eh, agradecidos a este magisterio de Carlos Toape. Right. Muchas gracias. No, uh... Dr. Mariana Papa Stefano, and apologies for uh, destroying your name. <laughs> no problem at all. First of all, let me thank you very much for this invitation to join such a wonderful company, this group of people, and special thanks to Amos for organizing this event. Uh, I feel very happy. Uh, it's a great honor and pleasure for me to to be in this position now to speak about uh, Professor Carlotto Appel. Uh, I'm sure that we will have very many opportunities to exchange ideas about his philosophy and the lasting significance of his insights, his um, wonderful endeavors on so many aspects of philosophy and so very important issues that are, that are now even more important in difficult and critical times. But because we will have such opportunities in the future for, for, for more formal exchanges over Professor Appel's uh, philosophy, uh, I've chosen to refer to his uh, uh, teaching, to that aspect of his, the aspect of the perfect teacher. I'm not exaggerating. Uh, I'm sure that many other people share my feelings when I say that uh, he presented a kind of ideal type of a teacher. And since my own specialization nowadays is more into philosophy of education, I will use up my three minutes to 
recall how we experienced my exchanges with him and uh, what he offered to me as a student and to so very many other students around the world. So I met Professor Karl Otto Appel in Berlin as a PhD student. And from the very first uh, times that I uh, exchanged ideas with him and listened to him, I felt that I was struck really by the fact that he was so uh, approachable to students and so ready to share his ideas and listen to a student's views. It was so impressive that he was very uh, interested in engaging the student very deeply in philosophy. To him, uh, his own philosophy and very many other uh, persuasions in philosophy were sources of deep engagement. And he managed to breathe enthusiasm in, into all exchanges and endeavors and discussions in seminar groups as well as during his lectures. Uh, I would like to emphasize that he encouraged independent mindedness. It could have been so easy for a philosopher of his caliber to just want disciples around him. Instead of cultivating any such spirit, he did quite the opposite. He tried to encourage and cultivate all sorts of intellectual and moral virtues and make people appreciate their own thinking and develop it even further. So for more on all this and more specifically on his philosophy in our future collaborations. So thank you very much. And before I stop, I apologize because I will have to leave very early because I have to, to catch a flight. So apologies and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, let's see, I have uh, a professor, uh, uh, Juan Nicolás, por favor. Yeah. <clears throat> Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes, Guten Abends. Eh, en primer lugar, quiero agradecer pues a los organizadores del acto y a Amos Nacimiento especialmente pues que me haya dado eh, la oportunidad de estar aquí con tantos colegas dedicados e interesados en la filosofía de, de Apple. ¿no? Eh, me gustaría compartir eh, una pantalla. Se ve, ¿no? Sí. Eh, Bien, eh, rápidamente, pues contar un eh, algo de lo que de la relación que hemos tenido, pues eh, desde la Universidad de Granada en, en, con, con Apple. Eh, mi, mi, mi interés personal por la filosofía de Apple surgió a partir de la, de la eh, traducción al español por parte de Adela Cortina y de Jesús Conil de la transformación de filosofía eh, en el año 1985. Eh, a partir de ahí, pues eh, eh, el interés fue creciendo por los textos suyos y eh, personalmente, pues eh, yo conocí a Apple en el año 1992, eh, en el cual invitamos a Apple a que viniera a la Universidad de Granada y tuvimos allí un, un, unas jornadas de discusión filosófica con él y eh, pues eh, ahí tuve oportunidad de tener algún trato personal y eh, aquello acabó pues en la publicación de un volumen que fue eh, Discurso y Realidad. Eh, después publicamos también eh, otro volumen de textos de, de Apple versus Habermas y eh, luego se han ido haciendo también en, en la Universidad de Granada pues algunas tesis doctorales sobre el pensamiento y sobre la filosofía de Apple. Aquí he puesto tres, consenso, evidencia y solidaridad, eh, eh, una brújula para la vida moral 
y lenguaje y corporalidad en la filosofía eh, de Apple. Son pues algunas de las investigaciones que, que se han ido haciendo en la Universidad de Granada sobre eh, el, el pensamiento de Apple. En el año eh, en 2017, a raíz de la muerte de Apple, pues eh, organizamos unas jornadas a las que eh, asistieron, bueno, aquí eh, esto fue, son algunas de las fotos que hicimos para allá, ya las hemos visto anteriormente, eh, de las que se hicieron para, la, para esa jornada del año 2017. En esta jornada, pues, eh, tuvo eh, la propia Dorotea Apple y luego, pues, otros investigadores de, del pensamiento de, de Apple. ¿Mm? Eh, y eh, ese, este, estas jornadas acabaron eh, pues eh, publicadas los textos en un número monográfico de la revista Disputatio. ¿Mm? Y eh, ahora mismo pues tenemos en marcha desde hace ya algún año eh, un proyecto de publicación de, de textos de Apple traducidos al español en tres volúmenes, donde fundamentalmente lo que se ha querido recoger es eh, en qué medida el proyecto de transformación de la filosofía que Apple plantea en los años 70, pues finalmente ha sido ejecutado por el propio Apple en diversos aspectos filosóficos. Eh, el, en el primer volumen hemos recogido fundamentalmente pues, eh, artículos, textos eh, relativos a la filosofía primera, sentido, validez y verdad, fundamentación filosófica última, filosofía primera post-metafísica, en el, en el eh, volumen, a ver, ahora cómo salgo de aquí, perdón. Eh, ahora no sé cómo volver para atrás, perdón. Eh, Juan, dale al índice, al marquito, al marco de índice, al aspa de índice. Es que no veo el aspa de índice. De, en la parte superior, en la parte superior. En la parte superior. ¿Puedes hacer un resumen diciendo de qué trata cada volumen? Eh, sí, perdón. El, el volumen segundo que está dedicado fundamentalmente a la concepción de la, de la eh, ciencia transformadamente desde el proyecto de, de Apple y el tercer volumen que está eh, dedicado a textos fundamentalmente de ética. ¿Mm? En ese proyecto pues, participan algunos de los que estamos aquí hoy hoy presentes. ¿no? Eh, luego, eh, para terminar, pues solamente destacar eh, un par de, de rasgos de lo que es la obra de, de, de Apple. Eh, por un lado, pues en el aspecto personal, pues eh, Apple ha, ha sido un, una vida dedicada a la reflexión filosófica y en ese sentido, pues creo que, que es... Mm, eh, pues digamos modélico y algo que, que merece eh, ser puesto en valor ¿no? y, y por otro lado en el, en el aspecto filosófico pues son muchas las aportaciones que ha hecho, aquí se han mencionado algunas eh, 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 por destacar alguna pues desde su, la, la teoría eh, el consensual de la verdad que ha ido elaborando pues eh, a partir de ahí, eh, donde se ha sido, ha sido incorporado pues, también un, la, una evidencia de carácter fenomenológico, desde ahí pues, estamos intentando eh, ver cómo se puede aprovechar este planteamiento de Apple de cara a uno de los problemas 
fundamentales que ahora mismo tenemos eh, planteados en, en el mundo filosófico, que es el problema de la posverdad. Y pues estamos viendo cómo la propuesta de Apple eh, se puede ser fructífera y puede ser útil de cara a abordar este problema que está poniendo en cuestión la, la, la racionalidad tanto en sentido teórico como en el sentido práctico. Y nada más y muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, doctor Nicolás. Y ahora, um, doctor Shekel Horn from Vienna, Austria, please. Sí, muchas gracias, Amos Namisiento y los otros uh, organizadores de, de este homenaje a uh, Apple. Uh, yes, I, I will present some memories uh, uh, from uh, with, with my uh, encounters with, with Apple. Uh, I have to take you back to the early 1990s uh, because my most in Intense time with Carlo to Apple was during the dialogue program uh, between Latin American the liberation ethics and discourse ethics. Uh, this dialogue, which lasted uh, from 1989 to about 1997, uh, took place both in Europe and in Latin America, uh, the conferences. And this dialogue was a novelty, I think, in the history of philosophy. It seems to me that it has not uh, yet been fully appreciated in Europe. Uh, never before had Europe, European and Latin American philosophy stood face in face in a dialogue process lasting several years. It's a, a novelty in the history. Uh, Until then, European philosophy had largely ignored or even denied the existence of Latin American philosophy. Uh, when I told colleagues at the end of the 1980s that I was also studying Latin American philosophy, I was told, you are working on something that does not exist. Uh, In his latest book, Habermas, uh, Auch eine Geschichte der Philosophie, Habermas has stated an important self-relativation of his own thinking. In the post-colonial age, his, he, he says, of a global multiculturalism, the claim of post-metaphysical thinking to universality can ideally, ideally only be defended in an intercultural discourse among equal participants. Habermas speaks only from an ideal <laughs> discourse, yeah? He, he, he didn't enter real, but uh, what Habermas postulated as an ideal, Apple uh, already realized in the 1990s. He defended uh, his philosophy, especially the, his conception of discourse ethics in an intercultural dialogue. Uh, since I, as, as a young philosopher, uh, was at that time one of the few philosophers who had knowledge about both philosophies, you know, discourse ethics and liberation ethics. And therefore, it was a privilege I was uh, in, the, in, the, in the midst of the storm, uh, in the center of this uh, often heated debate. Uh, and I remember long long conversations uh, in which Apple questioned me about Dussel and his liberation ethics, and on the other side, Dussel about discourse ethics. I could tell many anecdotes <laughs> from these talks. I would only uh, uh, present a brief uh, look to the first meeting. Yeah? The first meeting, I think it was in December 1989, Uh, in Freiburg. In his lecture, Apple summarized uh, the main points of, of his discourse ethics, and Dussel, on the other hand, primarily brought up the social inequality of global modernity uh, and the problem of hunger of, of one billion uh, 
uh, people. And Dussel has already formulated a first critique on the two and discourse ethics from this view. And I still remember Apple's first reaction. It was very interesting for me. Uh, without going into the criticism in more detail, Apple said, yes, I agree with you uh, because for me, Latin American liberation ethics belongs to part B of this discourse ethics. No? You are part B of the discourse ethics. Uh, Tussle was completely astonished, a little bit frustrated, I think, <laughs> because he did not really know uh, what is exactly part B of the discourse ethics. And Apple uh, uh, said, uh, added uh, the Latin American uh, liberation ethics can be understood as an application of discourse ethics for Latin America. You are, apply, uh, you are an application discourse for original ethics, Latin American philosophy, original philosophical, philosophical ethics for Latin America. Uh, and uh, yeah, discourse ethics formulates universal uh, abstract principles. Uh, and Latin American ethics formulates the problems of contextual application. This was the first uh, encounter uh, but it was only the starting point, of course, for already in the conference in Mexico and above all in Sao de Boldo in Brazil, it has become increasingly clear liberation ethics itself developed an, uh, a foundation of universal ethics. It's not original ethics. To recognize this was not easy for Apple, not easy. Hence, the uh, dialogue between Apple and Dussel was a dialogue about different justifications of universal ethics. And this has become for me a cornerstone uh, of my own philosophizing. And it seems to me that this is enormously important today. For intercultural philosophy today is dominated by what Apple called the culturalist relativism. Intercultural philosophy is consequently limitly, limited primarily to an account of cultural differences. Apple and Tussle, on the other hand, have argued for years over the question of how a universal ethics could be justified. This, is, this was the theme, the main topic of this intercultural dialogue. That, Apple and Tussle and other had, had argued for years over the question of how universal ethics could be justified. And I think uh, in view of the right of the authoritarian systems, systems, uh, this uh, question seems to me uh, very important for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. It was a very interesting story. Uh, I certainly enjoyed it. Um, now, at this point, we are going to take a little break, uh, 10 minutes, because we're running a little bit late. So uh, it is now uh, 1035 in Seattle. That makes it... Uh, Michael, what about three, three to five minutes? You said 10 minutes, I think it's too much. Let's, have, let's make it three. Uh, we need a little bit more than three. Five. Let's okay. make it five. Okay. So 1040 by my time. So 40. Thank you. Cinco minutos. Nos vemos pronto. See, see you shortly. Visions bound. Yeah. Thank you very much. I have to leave. Bye bye. Thank you, Mariana. It was a pleasure. We'll continue talking. Bye bye. Bye bye.
Okay, uh, I think we're time. It's time to start the second session. Me parece que ya es hora de de una la segunda sesión. Um, nos que nos quedan uh, dos rondas de recuerdos. And two, we have two rounds of reminiscences uh, and a slightly longer presentation. I am going to be much, much stricter in this round over the three minutes. Lo siguiente, voy a ser más estricto sobre el tiempo porque ya 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 vamos tarde con retraso. La siguiente presentación es del doctor Dorando Michelini de Mendoza. Disculpen, eh, podría ser eh, en segundo lugar porque tengo un problema con la computadora. Uh, sí, yo creo que sí. Uh, bueno. Dr. Eve Budeberg from Frankfurt should be next. Sorry, I'm here, but I, I cannot talk. I am with the children on my own. So I'm, I didn't know that I was expected to say oh. something. Right. That's okay. We fully understand. Uh, well, in that case, uh, uh, Rene, uh, Dr. Rene von Schomburg from Aachen-Deutsch, Germany. Yes. Um, ah, there you go. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm unmuted now. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Amos, for this uh fantastic uh, event and for your kind invitation. Uh, you know, as a matter of coincidence, uh, I guess uh, I was not aware of that, but in 2009, I gave a keynote at the uh, University uh, of Washington in Seattle on uh, organizing um, co-responsibility in the context of social technological change on the occasion of the erection of a new society on the social study of uh, social technological change. Um, I'm not sure if you were then already in, uh, in, in, in Seattle or not, but um, uh, this is also a topic which, um, which I, I will shortly uh, speak about because uh, this um, coincides with my professional history and also, of course, with, my, with the conversations I had with uh, Apple over a longer uh, period of time. Um, I had the, the pleasure to invite him to a couple of um, uh, conferences we organized uh, with him in the Netherlands where I was then uh, teaching at the time. And I think uh, to make, you know, to make a very simple point which Apple of course is distinguishes from Habermas is that the discrepancy between uh, the actual uh, context of uh, of of uh, you know the 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 the, um, the the community of argumentation or the of the community of uh, of of communication versus the anticipated ideal uh, uh, community of communication is in itself an ethical relevant fact. Uh, so and this, of course, was both I think a personal issue and an issue of of uh, of his theory. Um, uh, so, in other words, uh, in German, saying you know the discourse soul sign, huh? the the discourse has to be has to, should should take place, and um, it was I think in uh, I guess you probably all have shared this experience with him. Um, it was very easy to engage in a discussion with him, um, but it was very difficult to end a discussion with him. Um, it was. Uh, <laughs> So uh, this happened also on those events. I think uh, we did not go to our hotels back in our conferences at three o'clock at night because there was no end to our conversation. Um, so um, it is was, I, I mean, this was not only positive, I must say, to be honest, because discussing my PhD thesis uh, with him led often to discuss discussions which did not have anything to do with uh, my thesis at hand, but okay. This is a side <laughs> remark, um, I, but it just pops up in my mind now we are talking about him. Now I want just to continue this, this element of um, what, um, 
what I actually now call organizing um, collective co-responsibility. I think um, his vision of a, of a macro ethics of uh, co-responsibility against the uh, background of the ecological crisis and the context of global social technological change um, motivated me actually to work further on this. And I think um, his preoccupation, of course, was was very much on the justification of his ethics, of course. Uh, at the same time, he thought that, uh, and this was his reference, I think, uh, he was a sort of advocate of what he called always the thousands of dialogues and conferences which had to take place globally um, to mediate uh, this um, meta ethical discourse, so to speak, but um, uh, also as uh, public debate, as a meta institutions which would incorporate this notion of uh, co-responsibility. Now, I think, uh, although I, I, I would not disagree here with him, but uh, I think it is insufficient actually to to um, to address uh, this ethics in, let's say, in a social ecological context, um, only in in the meta institution of uh, of public discourse. Um, I also think that um, uh, that uh, we can think of ethics of, of co-responsibility driving our social systems, and um, this is actually a sort of deficit, I believe. Uh, especially in the thinking of the old Frankfurt School and its late followers, because rather than expecting from these social systems as such as science or economy to evolve further in a social desirable way, and thus to provide, uh, let's say, improved social functions, the common thinking was rather to be suspicious of the capacities of these systems to further evolve. Um, initially, they may have perhaps be even too easily black boxed as causes of verdingling or colonization of the life world. So Habermas um, rightly, I think, criticized the shortcomings of traditional Marxist analyzers, which even assumed the autonomy of a self-producing economic system. Now, uh, however, I think- Schoenberg, I, I hate to interrupt. Yeah, yeah, no, it's two, 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 one second. So, you Thank know, you. Uh, so, so, um, so in other words, uh, in a post-Marxian sense, uh, we we only have put our hopes on uh, the political changes, let's say the political system, as a, as a as a condition for changes of the other systems, and of course fed by a public agenda. But my short point is actually that um, we could actually think of uh, what I have called responsible innovation, and which I have developed further, not in the capacity as a philosopher, but as a policy advisor of the European Commission to make uh, a new innovation paradigm, which actually is a picture of, uh, of making actors agents of change rather than be only subject for change. And this is of course also the idol of, uh, of, of, of um, Apple's ethics and what I uh, inherited or indebted to Apple is especially this, this point to make, to anchor uh, an ethics of collective co-responsibility in our institutions of economy and, and society. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry I was then too long, Michael. This is fine. That was very I, interesting. I will, I, for people who want to know, I share a link in the chat so people can, can download things if they wish. Thank you very much for that. Okay, let's see. Uh, ahora, uh, en condiciones. Doctor, do, doctor Michelini. Perfecto. Bueno, antes que nada, un agradecimiento a Amos Nacimento por la organización de este encuentro en homenaje a Carlos Otto Apple y por la invitación a participar en el mismo. Y un cordial saludo también a la familia Apple y a todas y todos los participantes en este encuentro. En el programa se dice que este evento celebra también el Día Internacional de los Derechos Humanos y el cincuentenario del Programa de las Naciones Unidas para el Medio Ambiente. Además, propone resaltar los aportes de la ética del discurso en relación con temas como los derechos humanos y la ética ambiental. Los derechos humanos y el cambio climático son sin lugar a dudas importantes retos para la humanidad. La ética del discurso en su versión apeliana 
comprendida como macroethic der Menschheit, puede contribuir tanto en el ámbito teórico como en el ámbito práctico a la dilucidación filosófica de tales tópicos. Sin embargo, en el contexto de este encuentro, quisiera destacar lo siguiente. Las investigaciones éticas y los aportes específicos de los colegas latinoamericanos que se ocupan de la ética del discurso apeliana han resaltado, obviamente de forma no excluyente, el impacto de la obra de Apple también en otros campos problemáticos como la justicia, la conflictividad, la exclusión, la participación democrática y la corresponsabilidad solidaria. En este sentido, la realidad histórica y política de América Latina, como así también los problemas políticos y sociales específicos, han puesto de relieve la relevancia de esta macroética, especialmente a la hora de definir y asumir como aspectos centrales de la reflexión filosófica los condicionamientos materiales de la situación comunicativa y del discurso práctico. Esta macroética ofrece a sí mismo criterios para evaluar críticamente situaciones y conflictos reales de la convivencia humana. Pienso que los criterios ético-discursivos, junto con la teoría de la democracia deliberativa de Jürgen Habermas, pueden hacer aportes concretos y valiosos para el esclarecimiento, la comprensión y la posible resolución de conflictos, como el que se da, por ejemplo, entre el pueblo mapuche y el Estado chileno en el proceso de formulación de una nueva constitución. Las características del discurso práctico y la tensión entre la comunidad ideal y real de comunicación son igualmente importantes aspectos del pensamiento apeliano en el contexto de las relaciones interculturales y pueden hacer contribución tanto para la fundamentación teórica como para la ponderación práctica de una ética intercultural. Para cerrar esta breve exposición, quisiera recordar que los trabajos presentados en los coloquios latinoamericanos de ética del discurso desde el año 2006 que se realizan en nuestra ciudad de Río Cuarto, en Argentina, de la ética internacion internacional del discurso, la red, desde el año 2012, así como los aportes que se publican en la revista Ética y Discurso desde el año 2016, dan cuenta amplia y detalladamente de las reflexiones y los debates mantenidos en torno a las cuestiones mencionadas. Esto es todo por el momento, creo haberme mantenido dentro de los tres minutos. Muchas gracias. Sí, muchas gracias. Uh, y ahora, uh, eh, el doctor Pinzani. Por favor, siga. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I would like to thank particularly Amos for organizing this. Um, I will limit myself to share some uh, uh, memories of Carl Otto Appel. I won't uh, discuss a specific uh, philosophical issue. Um, it was maybe the most uh, relevant meeting that I had when I was a student. I was still an undergraduate student when I first met Carl Otto Appel in Florence, which is my hometown and where I studied philosophy. And it was an occasion of a visit of him. He came to Florence and he gave a presentation, of course, on Let's Begründung. And I was asked to translate his German presentation into Italian for my colleagues. And so this was actually the first time that I really got involved Uh, with, uh, uh, with his philosophy. And it was, of course, not an easy task because as you all know, it is, uh, uh, as it was already said, his writing style was not very uh, easy. And what I remember is that I was able uh, to meet him personally and to discuss with him also some difficulties that I had with the translation. And I was flabbergasted by the way in which he really was able to transmit humanity and, as it was said, also this uh, incredibly capacity of uh, getting in touch with a simple student as I was at the time. And uh, this was really, this had a lasting effect because uh, for the first time I was aware of the relevance of the discourse ethics. And since then I started, <laughs> I started studying it more systematically And it became actually the object also of my PhD when I went to Germany later. And uh, I unfortunately, we lost a little bit contact. Uh, I got more interested into Habermas philosophy, but 
I'm glad to say that uh, in Brazil, there is a very lively community of Apple scholars. And uh, the result of this is, among other things, the fact that we published a special issue of the electronic journal Ethica, in which, uh, which was dedicated to Carl Otto Apple's philosophy and his impact in Latin America. And so I will put the link in the, uh, in the chat so that you will all be able to uh, have an access to these papers. Among them is also a Portuguese translation of a very beautiful text that uh, uh, Jürgen Habermas dedicated to Apple. Thank you very much. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. Um, it was a lovely story. Uh, okay, now we move into another part of the program, um, a presentation titled Considering Worldwide Application of Discourse Ethics uh, by uh, my colleague, Amos Nascimento. Or las, el siguiente momento del programa es una presentación considerando la aplicación mundial de la ética del discurso por Amos Nascimento, uh, digamos unos siete, ocho minutos. Uh, uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, yes, I'll try, to, I'll try to say something very briefly. Uh, I shouldn't be giving a, a scholarly presentation neither, but just to honor what Professor uh, Michelini has already mentioned, that this event not only brings many colleagues together, thank you very much for your presence. Uh, uh, thanks for the family of Professor Apple that uh, has also supported us in this initiative. And, and thank, thank, thanks to all of you. I wonder, Michael, I think there's still one, one group that hasn't said anything. Maybe it would be better to go to them first before I, I speak, what's your idea? Uh, no, I think that's fine. And then uh, you can speak and close the session. Yeah, let's do that, let's have the- Yes, okay. Thank all you. right, so uh, in, la, in the next section, in la, in la siguiente sesión, uh, Juan Carlos, uh, Siurana de Valencia, España, Siri Gramnun Carson from Trondheim, Norway, Linda Lovelli de Genoa, Italia, and Jorge Zuniga de la Ciudad de México. Uh, Doctor, uh, Doctor Siurana, por favor, siga. Eh, hola, eh, hello, Mr. Great pleasure for me to be here with you. Uh, Talking about Carlo to Apple and remembering uh, his thought and how his thought has influenced in our thoughts and, and our life. Well, I'm going to talk in Spanish. Uh, voy a empezar diciendo que, que yo conocí a Apple a través de la profesora de la Cortina. Realmente yo fui alumno de la profesora Adela Cortina. Y, eh, y curiosamente, bueno, aparte de que ella nos introdujo un poco su pensamiento, Y, y también me animó a la lectura de, de sus textos. Eh, fue presente en la introducción de su libretica mínima, eh, en el prólogo que hace José Luis Aranguren, en el que eh, este autor recomendaba eh, trabajar la ética, intersu no solo la ética intersubjetiva, sino también la ética intrasubjetiva, ese diálogo interior que nosotros somos. Fue así como eh, yo le propuse a Adela que... Bueno, si la persona que había hecho un prólogo a su libro decía que este que había que trabajarlo, pues puede ser un tema interesante trabajarlo eh, en el pensamiento de Apple. Pedimos una beca del, del DAD, una beca del Servicio de Méndez en Cambio Académico. Me la concedieron y bueno, yo llegué a, a, a Frankfurt en el año 1992 con esa beca del Servicio Alemán de Intercambio Académico. Cuando llegué, eh, Apple no estaba, estaba en uno de sus viajes... Eh, intercambiando eh, debates con otros profesores, me recibió Frau Tutuatuneva, que seguramente muchos recordaremos, eh, me mostró ese enorme cajón donde estaban sus eh, artículos y sus capítulos de libros, y, y bueno, para mí fue un, una fuente eh, muy valiosa porque me los fotocopié todo y empecé pues a, a empezar a, a, a trabajarlos con, con cierto detalle. Bueno, cuando me encontré con Apple, yo le dije que quería trabajar la ética intrasubjetiva, re reconstruir la idea de sujeto dentro de la ética del discurso, y él me dijo que quizá debería centrarme en el problema de la reflexión. El problema de la reflexión, él pensaba que era un, un tema central, y luego fue de hecho el tema central de mi, de mi tesina, el trabajo previo a la tesis doctoral que versó sobre el problema de la reflexión 
en Carlo Toapel. Y es que, eh, y otra de las cosas que, que me animó, ya que él decía que el tema de la reflexión era importante, me animó a reconstruir cómo ese problema había sido importante en el autor a partir de lo primero que había escrito. Empecé leyendo eh, su propia tesis doctoral y a partir de ahí empecé leyendo uno detrás de otro las obras que había escrito. Recuerdo que cuando se lo contaba él me decía, se extrañaba de que, de que me, me estuviera leyendo su tesis doctoral y, y bueno, fue interesante ver cómo eso que él cuenta en la transformación de la filosofía, que no solo es una transformación de la filosofía de la conciencia, de la filosofía del lenguaje, sino que es también una transformación en, en el propio autor, en, la, en, la, en el propio pensamiento del autor, es también una transformación en la manera como él entiende la reflexión en los primeros trabajos, cómo cambia su posición al respecto en los trabajos posteriores. Fue una experiencia interesantísima estar en Frankfurt. Tuve el placer de asistir a clases, por ejemplo, de Matías Kettner, que ahora lo veo y me alegra mucho verlo de nuevo. Aprendí muchísimo en sus clases, eh, clases sobre Lawrence Colbert, eh, etc. Eh, hice, de hecho, un trabajo para, para Matías Kettner entonces. Luego lo hemos tenido en Valencia, vino a un congreso que organizamos. Hemos, hemos tenido cierto contacto y fue, así ha sido un placer trabajar con él. Y, eh, y bueno, yo apliqué mi pensamiento, eh, apliqué el problema de, de la reflexión en Apple a una cuestión de ética aplicada como es el tema de cómo podemos dialogar nosotros con personas que ahora no pueden, dialogarse con, no pueden dialogar con nosotros porque han entrado en una situación de inconsciencia irreversible. Entonces el problema de cómo dialogar con las personas que ya no pueden dialogar con nosotros porque han perdido la capacidad de comunicarse y además de manera irreversible. ¿no? Esto me llevó a trabajar la, ética, la, la bioética y, y, y la verdad es que el pensamiento de Apple para mí ha sido muy inspirador me, me parece una persona extraordinaria, siempre que conversé con él me pareció impresionante eh, el ánimo que tenía siempre en las discusiones, las discusiones que tiene allí con Haber, más un, un, un seminario que impartió sobre, sobre Nietzsche, que fue también muy apasionado. Y luego las experiencias, por ejemplo, con los compañeros que estaban trabajando con él y Amos, Amos Nascimento, la verdad es que ha sido también un placer volverme a encontrar con él porque era uno de los estudiantes que estaba trabajando conmigo. Eh, sobre Apple entonces, tuvimos muchas ocasiones de debatir, estábamos en ese momento pensando en, no sé, parecía que estábamos construyendo la tercera generación de la Escuela de Frankfurt con la voz de, la, de, de Iberoamérica, etcétera, fueron eh, experiencias interesantísimas y me ha alegrado muchísimo volverte a ver, la verdad. Eh, y bien, yo lo que he, he llegado a construir a partir de, del pensamiento de Apple es lo que llamo una brújula para la vida moral. Antes Juan Nicolás hablaba de, de unos libros que ha publicado su editorial eh, de Granada, que es la, es la editorial Comares, pero bueno, uno de los textos que hacía referencia a una búlgura para la vida moral es la tesis que finalmente, una de las partes de la tesis que finalmente se publicó en Valencia y que construye esa brújula. Y con esa brújula la verdad es que ha sido mi orientación para todos mis trabajos posteriores. Con esa brújula le he aplicado, eh, la apliqué a la bioética, al tema de las voluntades anticipadas, la apliqué a muchas otras éticas aplicadas. Y, y a mis últimos trabajos, o sea, cuando escribo sobre temas que pienso que son relativamente nuevos, ética del humor, ética de la autoayuda, sobre los influencers, siempre está detrás la brújula para la vida moral que empecé construyendo entonces y por lo tanto para mí es maravilloso reencontrarme con, ese, con esos inicios que constituyen la, en estos momentos la, la médula, la médula espinal de todo mi trabajo. Yo siempre hablo de brújulas y cuando hablo de brújulas pues tengo en mente a Carlos Toapel y, y poder hoy compartir con vosotros este espacio, pues es para mí maravilloso. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. A ver. Um, Siri Granum uh, Carson, I don't, do not see you. Are you here? Ok, bueno. So, uh, next on my list is Dr. Linda Lovelli from Genoa, Italy. Uh, hi everybody. Uh, I'm very happy to be here to celebrate the author that uh, more than any other has affected my philosophical formation. I'm extremely grateful to Professor Nascimento for involving me in this project and for giving me the opportunity to see old friends and colleagues and meet new ones. Uh, my name is Linda Lovelli and I'm now an independent scholar in Italy. Carlotto Apple's philosophical perspective uh, has been for me a constant and essential point of reference in the whole course of my studies. The discovery of Apple's philosophical approach during my master at Genoa University has been for me a turning point. What impressed me especially was the systematic application of the self-reflective move that characterizes transcendental pragmatic argumentation to justify all aspects of human knowledge. 
This foundational and uh, systematic approach, including both theoretical and practical philosophy, is very peculiar in the contemporary philosophical context. Nobody but Happel, as far as I know, has used the self-reflective method he calls uh, transcendental pragmatic as the key for a transformation of philosophy as a whole. Attracted by this theoretical program, I decided to write my master thesis on Apple's transformation of transcendental philosophy on the wake of the pragmatic turn in the philosophy of language. I then continued to study Apple during my PhD at Chieti University in Italy in co-tutel with the Witten University with Matthias Kettner in Germany, tackling the issue of the foundations of ethics since I was convinced from the start of the validity of uh, his ultimate foundation as a foundation strategy of basic moral norms. The aim of my dissertation was, uh, however, to problematize what I considered a shortcoming of this course ethics, namely the refusal by both Appel and uh, Jürgen Habermas to make use of axiological concepts uh, to face the problem of justification in moral theory. I especially put in question the claim that uh, it is possible to ground basic moral norms without a prior foundation of what is ultimately valuable, namely that it is possible to rationally decide what is right without taking a rational stance on what is good. I argued that uh, it is possible to apply Apple's ultimate foundations beyond uh, Apple's explicit intentions to justify the value of human existence as a rational form of existence, and uh, on the basis of this, to articulate a conception of the highest good that must be presupposed, in my view, by every norm foundation in the discourse ethical sense. During my stay as a postdoc uh, at Frankfurt University for two years, I have further worked on the project of an axiological integration of discourse ethics, putting Apple in dialogue with uh, Alain Givert and Christine Karsgert. And at present, I'm trying to further develop the project I worked on during my time in Frankfurt. And in particular, I'm writing an article that, that brings Apple's discourse ethics together with Max Schiller's and Nikolai Hartmann's material value ethics. It would be nice for me to share the further developments of this research with all of you in the context of this new project. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much. And uh, now, ahora, uh, Dr. Jorge Zuniga Martinez. Muchas gracias, estimado Michael. Este, un poco para darle variedad de, eh, de idiomas al, al homenaje y también para que se, no, se note, se refleje este, que el, el doctor Carlos Toapel dejó una escuela tanto en Alemania como en América Latina, en Estados Unidos, en Europa. Este, voy a, a hablar en alemán para darle un poco de variedad a, esta, a, este, a este homenaje, ¿no? Eh, mi primera begegnung war im Jahr 2009 bei Carlo zu Appel, eh, bei ihm zu Hause. Eh, irgendwie, ich bin ein Kind von diesem Dialog eh, zwischen Enrique Dussel, Franz Inkelamer, Raúl von der Betancourt und Carlo zu Appel. Eh, und eh, meine erste Begegnung eh, war mit Anlass von, von meiner Magisterarbeit da, damals, in, in 2009. Eh, als ich ihn, als ich ihn eh, zum ersten Mal getroffen habe. Eh, von Carlo Toapel habe ich viel gelernt. Er war irgendwie eh, ein Lehrer für, für mich, obwohl er schon in Rente war. Eh, ich habe ihn eh, vielmal eh, zu Hause bei, eh, bei ihm zu Hause get, eh, getroffen. Und äh, wir haben immer so verschiedene äh, philosophische Diskussionen. Zuerst, äh, zum ersten Mal äh, zu meiner Magisterarbeit, aber danach äh, zu meiner Doktorarbeit in Frankfurt gehabt. Und äh, bei vielleicht mein, mein, mein wichtiges Lernen bei ihm war, als er mich, mir äh, einmal äh, ge äh, gesagt hat, Und er sagte, dass die Philosophie ist nicht neutral. 
äh, Philosophie ist nicht neutral, sondern äh, Philosophie hat immer einen Standpunkt. Und äh, das ist genau Et äh, Ethik. Äh, Ethik ist, äh, ein, einen Standpunkt zu nehmen und äh, äh, irgendwie diesen Standpunkt äh, zu entwickeln. Ne? Er hat natürlich an Diskursethik äh, gedacht und äh, das ist äh, zum, zum Ersten. Zum Zweiten habe ich auch von ihm äh, diese, diese, äh, diese Geist immer zum, zum Reden, zum Argumentieren, zum, äh, immer einen Dialog zu haben. Äh, er war äh, als äh, Hans Hess von, äh, gesagt, äh, erzählt hat, äh, er hatte diese äh, Diskussion, diese Dialog bei, bei Enrique Dussel und sie, sie hat irgendwie verschiedene Standpunkte äh, vertreten. Äh, doch äh, Carlo Toppel hatte so viel Respekt äh, von, vor, vor Dussel und auch vor Henkel Amen. Und, äh, und ich glaube, äh, gleichzeitig war diese Situation. Äh, ich bin auch äh, sehr dankbar bei äh, Frau Judith Appel, äh, die immer äh, eine Person in der Geschichte, in der Story von, von Karl Otto Appel ist. Und äh, ich bin sehr dankbar bei, bei ihr auch und auch bei, äh, bei seiner Tochter Dorothea Appel, die jetzt diese Diskursetik entwickeln will. Äh, und und, und sie, sie, sie gibt viel Mühe äh, darauf. Äh, ich habe die besten Erinnerungen von Carlo Toapel. Er ist auf jeden Fall äh, in, Erinnerung, äh, in, äh, in der Erinnerung äh, bei mir geblieben. Und, äh, und ja, äh, ich glaube, dass äh, ich bin sehr dankbar bei, bei Dr. Carlo Toapel weil ich, äh, ich nehme ihn als ein Lehrer von mir äh, und irgendwie auch äh, wie, ein, äh, wie, wie eine Licht, äh, eine philosophische Licht, würde ich auch sagen. Äh, vielen Dank, äh, Amos, äh, Michael Forman, äh, auch, viele, äh, auch äh, vielen Dank an die äh, Teilnehmer hier in dieser, in dieser Sitzung. Und äh, ja, viele schöne Grüße alle. Danke, Scha. Uh, bueno, ahora sí, volvemos a la última sesión con el doctor um, Amos Nascimento. Now we have the very last session with Dr. Amos Nascimento. Um, take it away. Uh, thank you very much, Michael Foreman, and thank you all for being with us. And sorry for the time. Uh, we are a little over the time we have planned, and I appreciate you, you having the patience to continue with us. It is a great honor to have this moment to celebrate 100 years. This would mark 100 years of the birth of Professor Carl Otto Appel with whom I had a, the honor to study in Frankfurt where I finally received my, my doctoral degree. I met him also uh, around 80, 1989 and 90 and have many stories to tell, uh, but I'll, I'll, I won't go there. I'll just, uh, uh, even though I think we can get together in a different moment to remembrate and celebrate his memory, his teaching, his philosophy, and uh, most important for us today, the legacy, what continues and what will continue for decades to come, if not centuries. And I'd like to share very briefly uh, a, a brief presentation. I don't wanna talk too much in terms of the, uh, 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 do an academic presentation, but I think it is important to, at least to use this opportunity to launch, so to speak, a program. Some of you have already mentioned this, and I'll go over some slides just to highlight some programmatic aspects that we could uh, utilize as we launch this idea of uh, mapping the influence of Carl Otto Apple's philosophy around the world. 
Today, we have people from Europe, from Latin America, from North America. Uh, we also have connections in Asia. Uh, I'm very intrigued to see if we have also an impact of uh, Apple's philosophy in Africa. So today we're launching this idea that let's work together and map uh, not only what we have published, what we are doing, we were teaching, we have students accompanying us on YouTube, we have many others who are reading your books, uh, but what is the legacy around the world? Uh, so today we're launching this idea of mapping the impact of Carl Apple's philosophy, especially discourse ethics around the world. So this is the beginning. And next year, and hopefully even beyond, we'll have an opportunity to meet with each one of you, not only virtually, but also face to face. Uh, one of the ways we could measure the impact, first of all, can you see the, the slides on, on your screen? One of the way of measuring the impact of Carl Otto Apple's philosophy, it is a philosophy that provides global answers to global questions. And we are undoubtedly uh, facing global questions. Let me just mention, uh, because we're in this year, 1972, celebrating 50 years of discourse ethics. Uh, I was in a conversation with uh, Rainer Faust, who wanted to be part with us here today, but he could not. In one of the debates we had, was discourse ethics started in 1967 or 1972? Uh, I, I told him, yes, Apple presented the paper in 1967, but he published in 1972 in that collection, Rehabilitierung der Praktischen Philosophie. So this year, we're also celebrating 50 years of discourse ethics. And for me, one of the ways we could apply, uh, Matthias Kepner has worked with Apple on the unvendum, on the application of discourse ethics. Human rights is one area. Uh, Dorando Michelini and Professor uh, Nicolas have mentioned some other areas that we applied. Democracy is another area. Law is another part, uh, area. The debate with Enrique Dussel that Hans Schelskorn has mentioned uh, mentions another area, which is economy uh, that Apple also has discussed. And I actually, I credit, it's anecdotal, uh, uh, but I credit Dorothea Apple influencing her father to think about environmental issues. That's her degree. And we can notice a certain moment in, in, in the history when Apple starts talking about environmental problems. So uh, today we do have some environmental frameworks such as United Nations and the IPCC. And we also have some principles to address our environmental issues such as responsibility, Hans Jonas, precaution, including our friend here at the University of Washington, uh, uh, Gardner, uh, sustainability, which of course has many versions. And But I would like to argue for the importance and the relevance and better application of collective responsibility, or as Apple called, co-responsibility, mit verantwortung, as a better answer to environmental problems, especially issues related to global anthropogenic climate change. Uh, Apple is not alone. As, as a matter of fact, Peter French also came up with a principle of collective responsibility uh, that is very similar to Carl Otto Apple's macro ethics of co-responsibility. And my final point is that discourse ethics in the end, comparing all these principles that are available to us today, uh, seems to be a much better framework for uh, an environmental ethics of global responsibility. Uh, I had mentioned several things here. Uh, the important thing is that we can translate the language of environmental problems into the communicative uh, dimension of discourse ethics. For example, I, I think, and I read here at the bottom, the, in the communicative terms of discourse ethics, we can translate global environmental problems as global discussions, uh, communication, debates, arguments regarding global questions about global environmental issues that require what? Global answers. And then I play with the language that we can do better in English than in German. Responsibility actually means an ability to respond. So in the end, after all these debates, after all these conversations, we need to respond. Well, 
there is the United Nations, but the United Nations has limitations. For example, the lamination, the United Nations has a limited ethical framework to address some of those issues. The IPCC barely talks about the ethical challenges that climate change uh, presents to us. So a, a discourse ethics or uh, any other kind of ethics is necessary to address the issues. Science describes the problems, but it cannot, as Apple so well taught us in the article that inaugurated discourse ethics, science is limited to address the issues that are presented. Science cannot provide answers. It can only send it to a, a individualistic decisionism. So uh, we need to complement these frameworks with a better ethical framework. Well, so quick, uh, some proposals, the principle of responsibility of Hans Jonas. We all know Apple criticizes being too metaphysical among many other things. We also have the precautionary principle, which has been used in the European Union right now. It's been used in the city of Seattle, has adopted the precautionary principle to address its environmental problems. Uh, you know, we have sustainability principle that's been uh, around for a long time. It goes back to forestry in Germany in the 17th century, but is now incorporated in the United Nations, in many institutions here at the University of Washington. We talk about sustainability a lot, but as uh, one of the Apple's disciples, Conrad Ott, mentions, there's a difference between weak versions of sustainability, anthropocentric versions of sustainability. I want to sustain my life or environmental ecocentric versions of sustainability, which are stronger versions. I want to sustain the environment. Uh, and for these reasons, concepts of such as sustainability or sustainable development are also coming short of the kinds of answers we need to address environmental problems. So that's why we have two proposals. Peter French talked about collective responsibility in many books. I will, I will spare you from this, but just mention that he came up with some principles. For example, the extended principle of accountability as a better principle to address issues of responsibility beyond individual uh, the, um, limitations, the EPA, or the principle of responsible adjustment, PRA, that also anal analyzes the empirical communicative structure of corporations, shows that corporations have and are capable of intentional action. You can read in emails, phone calls, all this is documented. And then he concludes that because of that, we can trace responsibility in corporations and groups can be held responsible for their actions. But again, uh, I think that Carl Otto ethics of macro ethics of co-responsibility goes much further. He says, uh, of course, he also has principles. The first one is the one he takes from Jürgen uh, Habermas, the idea of universalization principle that Apple now, oh, sorry, Habermas now defends as, as a discourse theory of morality, no longer discourse ethics, but it's still based on the universalization principle. Uh, in their long, long debate of many decades that include you know, the Handlungsprinzip, a principle for action, or uh, later on the need to have yet another principle, the supplementary principle, Ergänzungsprinzip, which in his view, would bring together, would accommodate and bring alleviate the tension, mediate the ethics of conviction, Gesinnung's eth, and the ethics of responsibility. Uh, to conclude very quickly, uh, you can see that Apple has many principles and sometimes the question is, can we apply this? Are we still focusing too much on the justification? How can we actually apply uh, the framework tile A the part A of discourse ethics to concrete questions related to environmental issues, especially climate change around the world. Well, I think that discourse ethics, if we work together, we can continue this legacy and we can apply discourse ethics also to issues related to climate change. Why? And I conclude here. Global environmental problems require global answers. Global answers require global discussions, requires communicative ethics, and that's what we do for a living, so to speak. Uh, Carl Otto Apple 
uh, and Peter French develop a concept of responsibility that can help us address these issues. And the framework of discourse ethics could guide us, at least in two uh, possible directions, in, and I end here. Uh, those two uh, will help us to be communicative, but not only among us humans. And I think Matthias Kepner presented that today very nice. I like that formulation, Matthias, uh, how you talk about dignity, uh, uh, you know, in terms of ascribing a certain status. I think that's a very important direction for discourse ethics in the future. But on the other hand, also uh, the importance of us motivating action. That's another action, another part of discourse ethics that needs further development. Uh, it is not necessarily an ethics of motivation towards action. So I invite you all to join uh, this group, join us to continue to celebrate Carl Otto Apple's legacy, but also expand, criticize where you need it, and in doing so, honoring this important tradition. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Nascimento. Uh, if there are quick questions, uh, maybe uh, people could ask them by raising their hand. Um, Jorge Zuniga, por favor, siga. No, ah, so no problem. Uh, otherwise, I think it is uh, time to close our session, which went on uh, a bit longer than we expected. Uh, uh, for this, I apologize. Uh, but frankly, it was so interesting that it was really very difficult to stop anyone. Uh, entonces, voy a agradecerles a todos por su participación. Y les pido disculpas porque realmente uh, duramos más de dos horas. Uh, pero la conversación fue muy interesante y ojalá que siga hacia el futuro. Uh, muchas gracias y pues que disfruten el fin de semana. Hasta luego. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Thank you, everybody. Danke sehr, alle, die hier teilgenommen haben. 